Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. We're also on BitChute and YouTube, and you can find the links in the podcast description. I'm also a podcasting coach because I've got four other podcasts. You find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. Today, my guest, I mean, I, I'm actually going to read some of the stuff that you've done. Obviously, broadcasting voice coach, right? Yeah. But you've, you've done a voice actor a traffic mm-hmm. reporter, live host, radio personality, news director, and a weather girl. I mean, Back when you could call them that, yes. Back in the late 70s, I did uh, TV weather. It was in my first reporting job in Florida. And I made the mistake one day of just saying, hey, you know, wouldn't it be fun to do the weather? I wasn't saying that to anybody in particular. And then the weekday weather guy said, really? Really? Oh, okay. We can make you the weekend weather. But so I did that for a while. That was interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Wouldn't do it again. And now you have to be a meteorologist. You can't just be a weather person. You can't. Very good. So I suppose, I mean, I've mentioned what you do, but you might introduce yourself to the audience of the things that I might have forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would need a whole lot more than an hour to do that. It's so nice to be with you this morning or the, today, Roy. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm Susan Murphy, and I am a broadcast voice coach, which is a job I invented for myself last year, thinking that as I watched television, flipping around channels, what I had noticed was reporters and anchors today have a lot of great technical skills. They have some good writing skills, some good interviewing skills. But what a lot of them, I think, are missing are the qualities of a really authentic, most likely beautiful voice. And when I'm watching the news, I want to listen to a voice that is authoritative, that's friendly, that's strong, and I'm not hearing it. So I decided maybe I could become a coach. And I ran the idea past a couple of news director friends of mine, and they thought it was a good idea. So I, one of them sent me two of his reporters and then wrote me a recommendation. And the um, business took off from there. And it's based on everything I've learned in 40 years of being in the industry, from voice acting and taking singing lessons and just being an on-air person for as long as I was doing as much as I did. And I have developed a system that really does improve, not just broadcast voices, but really anybody's voice. And the singing lessons then, do you think that helped you with projecting your voice? The singing lessons. Well, it's an interesting story how I took singing lessons. I'd always done regional theater or not always, but I loved doing regional theater and sure, put me in the chorus or give me a couple of lines. And that was great. And a few, few, 20 years ago, I was cast in the show Footloose and I was cast as one of the mothers and the two mothers have a duet. And I said, you want me to sing a duet? Really? Uh, Okay. So I had about six or seven weeks. I called them triage singing lessons to get in shape for this duet, which scared me to death. So I took with a wonderful coach who taught me so much about singing and breath. And that really is the basis of what I teach my clients. Um, I There is just so much with your singing voice that so beautifully translates to the speaking voice I thought I would be crazy not to share this. So I've put together all of what I've learned in 40 years. But singing lessons were right up there at the top for learning not so much projection, because in what I teach people to do, you already have a microphone to do that. And even a business person or a college professor will often have a a, a system, a microphone system in front of them. So it's not so much projection. I often use the words bold and intentional in speech. And if more of us were bolder, speaking from our authentic voices, and if we're more intentional in what we say, more people will listen to us and we will become better listeners. There's the opposite side of that too, which is important for reporters and anchors and any business person. You have to learn to be a good listener as well as a good speaker. 
Yeah, exactly. I've listened to your commercial reel on your uh, website and you have great vocal variety. I mean, I don't know how many you cover, maybe five to ten, but it's like it's a different person. It's actually fantastic the way that you've done it. Thank you. I, when you become a voice actor, the general um, lessons or or expectations for a voice actor are that you'll be able to do a range of things in voice acting. And for me, I have learned that's actually not very true because of my background in news. Really what I'm best at is narration or an e-learning system. Can I do a character? Not really. Um, And I can do certain commercials, but I don't have that range because I'm not really trained as an actor. I'm trained as a news person and I'm very interested in voice. So there's that side of the voice acting. And then there's the other, which are the actors who want to become voice actors. And they often need help in in voice parameters and and things like that. So I'm the one side. So my range is actually not as good as most voice actors I have found. I am humbled by what I hear in my colleagues in the voice acting world. Um, When I started going on to, what's it called? There's there's a platform, a clubhouse, where it's just voice. And I was very late to the game with public speaking, so I eventually overcame that. But when I went on the clubhouse, I got so nervous. It was like really nervous for the first three or four times that I went on it. And I'm just curious because you've th- done so many different things. Did you go through phases like that as well, that you were comfortable in one and then you jumped onto something else and you went, ooh, or did it always just flow for you? I think it's sort of, almost always flowed for me. I've been doing it for a really long time since before I got into college. And um, I love to do things like back in the day when fashion shows were all the rage, I would host fashion shows, or I worked for a radio station where we would sponsor, you know, the circus at um, Madison Square Garden or whatever. And I would open the circus and speaking in front of 10,000 people just never really seemed to uh, concerned me. And I just was always sort of good at it. Trends. And then coming into television, um, I didn't do a lot of live television. A lot of my television work was tape. Oh, no, that's not true. I did a lot of live uh, fundraising for for public television. Nerves are just one of those things that if you look at them the right way, they can work for you. You really need to have nerves. And it's just getting those butterflies in your stomach to fly information. You don't want them crazy. You want them to work with you in your in your speech or your presentation. So I guess I've always been able to manage for what others is anxiety. And when I learned breath work, which was only 20 years ago, I guess I was doing some of it subconsciously, but now that I'm really conscious of it, it really does take away a lot of the fear of speaking in front of groups it just does breathing and because i've covered in way more detail like the breath work that people are actually kind of hyperventilating and everything I, I don't know have you actually experienced that or gone into that but I, i'm just curious of the kind of tips that you would give people for the breath work oh sure this is my favorite thing to do because when i teach yes we go through this very long process The breathing has to come from your belly, which most of us don't do anymore. We are born knowing how to do it. If you've ever watched a toddler have a tantrum, their bellies get real big and they wail and, you know, they just breathe into their bellies and we somehow lose that as we grow up. So almost what I do is I I teach people to re-breathe, to breathe again a different way or the way they were born breathing. And when you breathe from the bottom of your diaphragm, and you create what I call a clear, unobstructed pathway for air and energy, it settles nerves, it settles pitch. Mostly we speak at a pitch that is not at our optimum levels. So when I help you to uncover the pitch or the range that you should be speaking in, 
Then when we talk about what you're talking about, then tone or how we color the words in that range can usually produce a very beautiful voice. So it is sitting or standing, understanding that that voice is going to come from your diaphragm because when you breathe in, that air is going to go straight down into your belly and expand it. We're so busy. We talk so fast. Most of us kind of breathe from here. And it's very shallow. And sure, air gets into your lungs. It all works. But it's not the optimal breath that we should be using. So breathing from the belly is one. And the second most important tip, which is actually my number one, if you remember nothing from this podcast interview, Roy, if you remember nothing about any of this, that one takeaway from me would be before you speak, lower your shoulders. I had no idea your shoulders has so much to do with your speaking voice. Why? Because where do we carry tension and stress? Right there in our shoulders. So when you learn to release them, when you learn to just let the weight drop through your shoulders, no tension in the muscles across your chest or across your back, what you've done is you've loosened all the muscles in your neck and up into your jaw and into your face. And that does more to lower the pitch of your voice to where it's probably most beautiful than you have any idea. I wish I had known that 40 years ago, oh, and I only I, learned it about 20. I mean, I'm over four years having guests on this show, and that's the first time I heard that, but it makes so much sense now that you've said it. Yep. Shoulders. Just drop your shoulders before you speak. You'll be amazed at what it does. It's the silliest little tip, but it really works. Brilliant. And just curious, one for you, do you have a ritual before you go speaking in front of an audience and then that if you're teaching like people that are going to be on camera, you know, or on the radio. A ritual. As in, you know, some people jump up and down and others are breathing <laughs> and all right. different. There are people who do mouth exercises. There are people who do. No. OK, for example, I sing in the church choir and our warm ups often include some things that I will do before speaking. And one of them. Uh, is the shoulder lifts to your ears and bring them down and stretch your neck to one side and roll your neck around. Those exercises that just loosen up the muscles from about your shoulders up are super, super helpful. And then the other thing I always do is I go through my head what I plan to do and, and I remind myself of key words or key phrases very calmly, very gently. Sometimes I will say them out loud, which is a whole lot better than just speak, you know thinking them in your head. When you say things out loud, they stick a whole lot better. So I will occasionally do that. And before I start a coaching session um, with a client, I have about six pages of notes that I need to go through with them. And I always refresh my memory. And at this point, it's pretty much committed to memory. But I, I always like to review the notes even though I've looked at them a hundred times, it's it's um, it's uh, comforting in a sort of way, and it's encouraging, and it's like, yeah, I got this, I got this, I know how to do this. Excellent. And I know on your website you've got like uh, W O S O T. I didn't know what it was. I looked it up. Voice over sound on tape. Right. Yep. When I started the company, I thought I was only going to be working with broadcasters, and that's primarily my audience. Um, voice over sound on tape is if you're a reporter and you go out and the news director says, oh, well, this is just a little story. We just need a vosat. That just means shoot the video, come back, write a quick story about it, and we're going to let the anchor do it. Well, Reporters don't like to do vosats because it doesn't put them on the air. They want to do the package. The package is a big vosat, and the package has the reporter's voice on it. So a vosat is where a reporter, or rather an anchor, reads what a reporter wrote using the footage that the reporter shot. So vosat, I just thought was a clever little name. Like if you're in the broadcast business, you know what it is. 
And if you're not in the broadcast business, you don't know what it is. So I spend a lot of time explaining it. It's just, so now you know a little something about broadcast shorthand. Well, I suppose it was uh, you were yeah, pick, 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 picking your niche. So you, you said the people that you're looking for will know what it means. But you know what? One area that I'm looking to expand into is seminaries. I think ministers can very much use, yeah, they get all kinds of theological training and they, they, yeah, you take courses on how to do a homily, but I don't think they take courses in how best to use their voices with a microphone in front of a group. What I do translates very well, I think, into seminary for seminary students. So I'm investigating that too. So maybe I'll have to call it heavenly Vosat or something. I don't know. Brilliant. And I mean, I've listened to the before and after as well on your website. So I have seen the improvement from your clients. So you know, mm-hmm. I, I you know, definitely can say that off the cuff. With some of the stuff that you're saying that you're helping the coaches, like one of the things that I saw was mindset. And, mm-hmm. and I, I know it's so important, but I'd like you to just maybe touch on that and explain you know, what you're doing with people. Two things there. The first mindset that I often have to dismantle in a reporter or anchor's head is when you're growing up and you, I want to be a reporter, I'm going to be on TV when I grow up, it gets into your head what that should sound like. And it is usually a caricature of an anchor or a reporter, or it's a very 1960s version of a reporter or an anchor. And so I will often have to say, no, 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 no. That voice has to get out of your head. Um, You you need to be you. You're not imitating anybody. You can emulate them, but you can't imitate them. So it's what you can bring to the story. It's what you can bring to the show. It's how you connect to your listeners. And you don't do it by imitating anything. It's it's been um, sort of broadcast practice, particularly through the 80s and into the 90s, that anchors would develop, I call it singing the news, but a particular cadence where it wouldn't matter what the copy was, but it just sort of all has the same ups and downs in the voice. I cannot abide that at all. And that is so not what people are looking for now. Back when you didn't have a whole lot of options to watch news, and now the options are infinite. No, it's about the connection to the story. It's about the connection to your audience. So that's one mindset that I usually have to destroy. And the other one I have to sometimes fix is the, and I I don't want to call it imposter syndrome because that sounds like you're sick or it sounds like it's fatal, but everybody has imposter moments. When a, re- a younger reporter is sent out to cover, I mean, lots of stories are sort of formulaic or pretty easy to cover, but you might go to um, a, 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 a story where you've got to cover a lot of very scientific information or medical information. And reporters get sort of I can't do this. Uh, I, I'm not good enough to be able to do this. I'm not, mm, I don't, I, I can't do this. This is scary to me. So I have to show them that their journalistic training has to kick in on every level of story. And that really, if you remember to ask the right questions, if you remember to do the research, you know, coming up in my day doing research, we didn't have the internet. Doing research was hard. Newspaper stories, you'd go to the, an encyclopedia, you'd call somebody. It, research, I wish I were a reporter now. I, I love to research things. So as long as you do that work and put it together, and as long as you understand the story, then you share it with your viewers. You share it with the people you work for. You work for your viewer. You work for your audience. You are their guide to the story. Even in business, people who are speaking in front of audiences of all stripes, they are there to learn from you. So you're the guide and they're the hero. 
you're sort of the Gandalf to the um, Lord of the Rings crew. You're the um, Yoda to the Star Wars crew. You're the guide. And you are there to teach and inform and entertain. And I'm just curious because I've got the other podcast, uh, the Awakening podcast, where I'm kind of exposing fraud, corruption, but with yeah. solutions. And what I'm noticing, I mean, I've seen a lot of different things where they had loads of news presenters around the world just regurgitating the same thing. And I don't know, is it five or six corporations now that own 90 percent of the media? I mean, from coming from your journey to look at that, that must be kind of not, not great when you see how it's kind of done now. Whoa, there's a whole show, Roy. We could do a whole show just on that. I hear that all the time. And there's a certain amount of that that is true. And it occasionally does filter down into the newsroom. I remember one example years ago when I was a radio news director. I was asked not to do a particular story about, it was a certain make of car. I don't remember the, the, the all the details. But one of our big advertisers was a car dealership that, you know, sold those cars. And there was something about a story that I did where the general manager came and said, uh, you know, could you back off on that? And I put up a fight and I actually don't remember who won the fight. Something tells me it wasn't me. But yeah, that's not right. That is so not right. Um, what you what we hear now tends to be partisan journalism, which being fair, being accurate, being non-biased means a whole lot of different things than it used to in some areas, in some it's the same. And I think a viewer and a reader and a listener, I think your job, you have a job too. It's not just my job from my end. It's your job to not trust one particular source, not when you have infinite sources at your fingertips, but it's to research where the truth is and to examine the other side of the story, to examine what other people are saying and see where you find truth, not belief, not opinion, not hyperbole, the truth. And it is part of the audience's job to do that. It's my job too, but everybody has responsibility in this right do you think absolutely and what i found is that i mean from what i'm exposing like google unfortunately has been infiltrated so i use brave but what i found and i keep telling people now is it depends on the question you ask in the search that you're doing is such a thing safe or why is it not safe and you get totally different answers and yes. then you can actually go through the whole lot People love to cite polling numbers. Oh, it's all in how you ask that question as to what answer you get. So a poll, technically about the same things, could have vastly different answers or results because of how that question was phrased. What trigger words did you use or didn't use? Um, so you really have to be very careful and look at where the polls come from who asked the questions. I used to say to students back when Wikipedia was all the rage and every kid in the world, every college kid would go to Wikipedia to research X, Y, Z. I'd say, fine, you want to start Wikipedia? Feel free. Look at the bottom of the article. Look at what their sources are and start there and keep going back. That's how you, you know, it's you, you follow the trail, which is the journalistic trail, the money trail, the political trail, they're all almost the same trail. Exactly. Oh boy, could we ever get into <laughs> it? Oh, I don't even, whoa. Yeah, I, and I don't know what to do about it. Well, I, I'm finding that like, if you look now, it's the podcasts are actually gaining momentum. Like the, the highest at the moment is Joe Rogan. And like, 
I mean, to me personally, I don't know as he controlled opposition from some of the things that he's thrown out there and everything, but at least he's getting the message out there. He's having guests on that are talking about the topic, which in turn allows people then to kind of think for themselves. Yes. But who, are you talking to all the right people? Are you talking to the to people with various, you know, there's there are three sides to every story, yours, mine, and the truth. So we have to get all sides of the story, and that's what's not happening. Or people are taking the truth and turning it upside down or finding the alternate truth. Remember that phrase that came up a couple of years ago? Alternate truth? Oh, I don't know about that, but that's... That's what we have to combat. And these horses are all out of the barn. I don't know what you do with this now. Um, one of the things in my industry that has become a, a bit of a focus for a lot of newsrooms is something they're calling solutions journalism. It's not just talking about the problem. It's pushing it forward in finding, yes, covering the problem, but then starting to uncover some solutions or starting to... Um, create the appetite for finding those solutions. And I think if anything is going to save journalism, that might be it, is how do we find solutions to climate change and viruses and political discourse and world peace? And I mean, it's, it's daunting. I, when I was coming up, we didn't have these existential crises to cover. I mean, we didn't necessarily have to do solutions journalism back in my day, and now reporters do. So the, well, or they should, but it's really just starting to take shape and form. And being a reporter is hard. Being an anchor is hard. When you report hour after hour, the same stories and the same tragedies and the same, you know, thoughts and prayers and the same... I can't believe we're talking about this again kind of stories. It takes a very big toll on reporters' psyches. And mental health issues in newsrooms is very much becoming an issue. Reporters and anchors are leaving for better pay, for better hours, and for less stressful stories. And again, I don't... Money is one solution, but it's far from the only. No, it's interesting you said that because I, I like I don't because when I'm researching for uh, the Awakening podcast, I mean I'm, I touch on stuff that's so deep and like even the one today I put out now is about the falling gun, the organ trafficking. I didn't know anything about that prior to that, but I went deep into it and started looking at all the videos. But I don't. I mean I kind of go into it and feel the emotion and then come out and then I just kind of get out my life. But I I know a lot of other podcasters. And they get really depressed when they're researching stuff and everything. And you can see it. So I can understand yeah. with the news, it, it, you know, the, the journalists and everything similar. Yeah, exactly. And it just doesn't let up. So, so to some degree, you know, people are burnt out on news. They don't want to watch it anymore. So now one says, okay, well, is part of the solution balancing there are, there are good news stories everywhere, and there are people who help everywhere. And I think, wasn't it Mr. Rogers, who was the beloved children's host on television back in the 50s and through the 70s, 80s, really, where he would very calmly say to children, you know, when you see a terrible scene or when you see terrible things going on, look for the helpers. So we need to focus on the helpers. You know, the one that the one story that sticks with me is um, as the pandemic just crashed into New York City and hospitals and morgues just were overflowing with more than they could possibly handle. And somehow somebody got the idea that every night it was either at six or seven o'clock, people would hang out their windows and bang on their pots and pans as a symbol of thank you. To healthcare workers. Uh, and that to me, it, it was organic. It was a, a, a lovely tribute and which maybe raised spirits for a minute or two or three. 
for these people who did a yeoman's job for months, you have to do those stories too. Well, like I would wish that there's a lot more of the positivity in the news, but like even on the radio and everything, it's every hour that they kick in. But look, it is what it is. I, have you come across people that are getting out of the news and kind of setting up on their own? Because I, I had one guest, I know it's Christy, I forget her surname. She's been on the show and on the Awakening one, you know, that she basically, she just got sick of what she was seeing and she just became, uh, you know, her own show promoting herself are you seeing much of that no i can't say as i'm seeing that in broadcasters going um leaving the airwaves and and heading to podcasting most of them tend to go into public relations for hospitals or school districts or large companies to tell help tell their stories medical centers are creating their own TV studios and uh, videos to help patients or to train other doctors. I think that's where I find most burnt out journalists going. Um, I, I don't know of too many of them who are starting their own businesses or creating their own media empires or, or their own media companies. I could be that they are. I just don't know them, but I've not seen it. And with the, the coaching then as well, like, I mean, we've touched on the breath work and I suppose the posture as well with the shoulders yeah. and just, mm -hmm. you know, so I suppose storytelling is another kind of important one. You might just touch a little bit on that because. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> right. In journalism school, it occurs to me that a lot of young journalists, they just get hammered about, you know, you have to tell the story fairly and without bias and, and you can't be part of the story. I spend a lot of time tearing that down. No, you kind of have to be part of the story. It's your job to be part of the story. You're working for people, your audience, who want to be taken along the journey of that story. Now, for something like a, a standard, if there is a standard anymore, like a school board meeting or city council, it's still about people. And very often there are stark, bright stories that come out of that. But a lot of it is is human interest or you're taking a large issue like homelessness and you're focusing on one small effort to eradicate it. And that storytelling has to involve connection. It has to involve using the right tone in your beautiful range that I'm going to show you where it is so that you're not your pitch isn't so high that I can't listen to you anymore. Um, and that there are ways to tell that story that allow your viewer to completely digest it. That's the other problem. Reporters spend all day, usually on one, maybe two stories. They know it backwards and forwards, and then they race through it and do it in such a way that by the time the story's over, you lost me. I couldn't follow. I call that the forest for the trees syndrome. You knew what it was all about, but you forgot that I didn't. So my very famous saying is, write it like a fifth grader, deliver it like a college professor. Simple, bold, beautiful, occasionally beautiful language, told with heart, told with intention. I use that word a lot allows your viewer and you need you need to pause you need to use short sentences it brings the viewer along so that sort of storytelling is what resonates tv is not the be all and end all of any story it can't be you get a minute 50 most reporter packages are just under 2 minutes to some people that's a lot of time but it's really not um you can't possibly tell the whole story so don't try tell the most important part or then you know you could go to a website or you could go to the newspaper story that spent you know half a page uh, telling a story on television so that your viewer is completely pulled in with you that's that's key and it requires it requires some effort it requires experimentation it requires 
really being involved and reporters are told not to be involved in in school okay and like you mentioned the pause and i know that just from like doing lots of toastmasters speeches you get i kind of got over it that yeah allow sometimes people to react and kind of just absorb what you've said but i presume it's kind of difficult as well in the environment when you're really cut for time but you have to get the information out so how yeah. do you kind of meet meet that road when you're kind of you should pause but you're trying to get as much information as possible right um i was just working with a reporter yesterday who Sometimes reporters think the more words they put into a story, the more, I'll use the phrase academic, it sounds, a longer sentence sounds smarter, doesn't it? Not always. In fact, on television, never. Um, if you take out some of the adjectives, if you take out some of the filler words, please don't start a sentence with um, a preposition. So, while, and, but therefore with i hate that because that's a phrase that prevents you from getting to the meat of the story so we we work on telling it very simply in as few words for you as possible allowing the people you interview in the story to really tell the story you're there just to sometimes i'll use the word you know some stories you're playing the traffic cop you just are weaving the words of other people together. So there are some stories I'll say, get out of their way. Let them tell it. Then there are certain other stories, depending on if you get bad interviews or, well, then your writing and your storytelling is going to have to save it. But most of the time, keep it short, to the point, take out extra words, and let your interviewees do the storytelling for you. I'm not sure on this one, but say if you're interviewing a person, whether it's a radio or just to, you know somebody concerning what happened, sometimes you have to drag the words out of people or they give you a yes, no answer. Have you any tips or tricks to kind of navigate that? That's the worst. Oh my gosh, that's the worst. Well, obviously the first suggestion is don't ask a yes or no question. Make them all open-ended. How do you feel about, tell me about, what more can you add? What was it like when, take me back to, get them get them to tell the story. You're, don't ask so many yes or no questions. Um, but then another trick I will often uh, tell my reporters when you're dealing with politicians or scientists or doctors, or engineers or, or people who are highly skilled in one particular thing, and you're trying to do something that is going to be understandable for a general audience. And I, you know, write it like a fifth grader. I if if so you're asking questions and your eyes are starting to glaze over, like, okay, I can't, I have no idea what you're talking about. Let them finish. And then you thoughtfully say, well, um, I'm wondering if you were going to try to explain this, ex this exact same thing, if you needed to explain it to, say, a sixth grade class, how would you explain it to them? I think my listeners, my viewers would appreciate that. Oh, OK. So they'll go back and not only explain it in a way that your viewers will understand it, but you're going to understand it, too. So you have to break things down into very understandable um, chunks of material by just getting people to, you know, to tell stories or to go back in time or what it was like. That can usually, and then the last question you always ask is, is there anything you want to talk about that I didn't cover or that I didn't ask about? That can often get you to somewhere you had no idea that story was going to go. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Finally, I've been asking a lot of my guests about the social media because we all kind of, I don't know, yeah, it, it kind of wrecks your head because we, we think we have to be everywhere, but everyone seems to find the one that they love. And I'm just curious, which ones have you found as uh, the sweet spot? Professionally, I'll have to admit, Roy, I haven't found that sweet spot yet. I was 
going to try to make it Instagram, but I'm not really sure how to do that Facebook. No, I don't think that's professional. Love. I guess LinkedIn is where I find many of my clients, certainly news directors and executive producers are there. And that's kind of where you gain uh, professional cred. So I guess LinkedIn is probably my favorite um, place to either post something or share something. Um, and I I'm, I can't be all things to all people. Hey, I'm the person who named your company Vosat. <laughs> Only the TV community even knows what that is. So I can't be all things to all people. And I'm not trying to influence. I'm not trying to gain followers. I'm not, I'm here. I love to teach. I love doing what I do. The, yes, I get paid for it, but the psychological income of watching a broadcaster suddenly find the voice they didn't know they had allows them to step into confidence they didn't know they had. And that to me is what it's all about. Which in turn, I'm assuming because I have seen the results from the videos you've put up, which in turn is a kind of a referral and marketing system because everybody they meet, they go, you need to talk to Susan. She knows yes, what she's and, doing. And that is the, the most wonderful compliment ever is, oh, yeah, yeah, Susan said I should call you. Susan recommended you to me that um, I've worked with sportscasters, meteorologists. I've worked with neurodivergent reporters. Um, I've worked bilingual reporters. They have a special challenge in that because they think and speak in two languages that's an interesting um uh dynamic that i love to coach because usually it's in their head that they think they're doing this and that wrong and i can guarantee them they're not so uh, i love all the challenges that um get thrown at me and a lot of times you know it's being an encourager a cheerleader a support system i'm happy to do that too Excellent. Susan, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. You might let me people too. know. <laughs> you might let people know where they can find you. Sure. You can find me on LinkedIn. Just look for Susan Murphy Voice Coach. There are a million Susan Murphys out there. So type in voice coach. And um my website is Susan Murphy Vosot, V O S O T dot com. And you can learn about me there. And that's pretty much um where you can find me. Excellent. I'll make sure I put that button, the audio on the video. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you so much. What a delightful time. So that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. As mentioned, we're on BitChute and YouTube. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five-star rating, and subscribe. Really helps. Until next week, take care.